Hey everyone, Tommy here. Welcome to this relatively short video in which I'm going to give you an overview of the Google Colab notebooks that I prepared as part of the script generation episode and just walk you through what each of these pages do, what it is that you can and how to actually get them up and running and really what it is you're doing. If you are already quite familiar with the likes of Google Colab or, you know, similar uh, Python executable frameworks that are available online, such as, say, Paperspace, then you're not really going to learn anything new here. Uh, probably you actually know more about some of this stuff than I do, but this is really for people who have never tried anything like this, you have absolutely no idea, but you're keen to give it a shot. And what I tried to do was I tried to write up everything in relation to the video in a way that is going to be as accessible for all of you as possible. So, We'll start off, I just want to give you a quick walkthrough on what I've prepared and then we'll go into the nitty gritty and actually try running a, a couple of these just so you can see how it operates. So first of all, as you can see here, this is the, the page that you get to on the link if you watch the video. And this is me sort of trying to introduce you to everything that's running here. And if you've never done anything like this, I'm hoping that this is going to be a useful stepping stone. Um, but the key thing is that it's actually broken up into five distinct segments. We have the introduction which is this right here. And then after that, we have the basic text generation. And this is a really simple setup where we just import an AI text gen library. We configure our GPT-2 model um, that is already, there's one pre-trained that's built in the AI text gen library. We just borrow that and we start generating text from it. After that, we then try and train our own custom GPT-2 mini model and we do it on your local uh, device. We do it on your local computer. Now, I'm not going to walk through the entirety of this, but I'm going to cover some of the steps because I don't really want to sit and have to do all this during the video because this will actually take a bit of time to run. Uh, similarly, the third part, which is where you train a custom GPT-2 Neo on, your, on a GPU using Google Colab. So this goes through the whole process and particularly I want to focus on how we get it to connect to Google. Uh, your Google Drive. So having a Google account and Google Drive is really important for this. You need it in order to run all of this code that I have put together. And then at the end of this, once it's all trained and configured, it actually allows me then to generate all the text that I want. If I just get right down to the bottom here, then I'm able to load back in from wherever and then I'm able to generate text from the model. And then just for fun, what I decided to do was actually provide you with a separate notebook which has the actual prompts that I use to write the episode from. So if you wanted, once you train a model, the first thing you could do is actually get it to write the same episode on the AI of Aliens Colonial Marines. Really hoping uh, Gearbox don't watch that video and get upset. But anyway, let's jump back to the very first part. So, as mentioned already, what we're doing is we're running in Google Colab or Google Colabatory. And Colabatory is basically this framework that allows you to write, uh, write and execute Python code. And you're doing it online and you're able to use compute resources in the cloud. And this is really useful if you just want to try your hand at this, but also if you're just not used to using coding frameworks, because a lot of the time if you're a programmer, you have to install a lot of APIs and tools to allow you to do what you want to do. And given Python is becoming increasingly pervasive for a lot of data science and machine learning, this is why it's being made available in this framework. So, first of all, uh, one of the things that we do need to cover is in the bot in the top right corner, you actually can't see it right now on my screen, bear with me. There we go, so I've got rid of myself. And you can see up here in the top right corner, we have a small button that says connect. And if I highlight it, it says click to connect. One of the things that's really important to understand is that when you're running Google Colab, right now, this doesn't do anything, it's just a web page. Once I connect to Google Colab, it will allow me to execute all of the code that's on this page. And of course, we have to do that subsequently for every page we run. Now, critically, this actually generates a lot of files. And when the files are created, they only are active for the session while this is still connected to Google Colab. So this spools up what we call a virtual machine or a VM. And then all these files and all the processing is going to be stored in those in that kind of that portion of the VM that we have created for us. Once it disconnects, we lose everything. And this is why particularly, as we'll see later on in part four or part three, I guess, when we retrain on a GPU, I make sure to back up everything to a Google Drive account. And so that becomes quite critical. So on to the point. 
So if we start by pressing connect, you'll see it begins to allocate resource and it's now connecting to the Python 3 Google Compute Engine backend. It's now connected and I'm connected to our computer and you can see here that it's actually got it's using 1.2 gigabytes of 12 gig of RAM and it actually has consumed a bit of disk space, but we actually have this bit of space available to us. Now, if you have a look over on the left hand side, you can see here we have the table of contents page and this is really just highlighting. Um, so right now I've actually broken all this into nice headers that you can jump between, but that's because I clicked on the table of contents and you can jump between it. If you look a little bit further down, you're going to find something called files. And now, because we've connected uh, to the Google Colab framework and their compute engines, we've now got all this existing files. We actually have like a file infrastructure that's made available to us because we're now connected to a device. You don't really need to worry about this right now, but I just wanted to try and explain to you what this framework is doing if you've never used it before and to help you get a feel for it. Okay. So, like I said, we're going to be running Python code and here what I've actually got is I've prepared some for you. And so this is a really simple piece of code. All it does is it prints the phrase hello world to the screen. So once you're connected, if you see here, if you highlight on it, a little plus sign comes up and that allows me to run this cell of code. So if I click on it, it runs hello world. Brilliant. It operated exactly as I intended and I even gave you some indication here in these, these screenshots below of what it looks like and the subsequent output. So whenever we're going to run code in any of these notebooks, you have to have connected to Google in order for it to work. Now the, pr the trick of course is then if you want to edit the files, because if you connect to it right now and then start doing stuff, what it does is it creates a temporary version of this notebook running in a VM. And then as soon as you are finished with it, it'll discard it. But also you can edit this file. And so there's two ways if you want to edit this file. Say you wanted to change what it what it says here, because I've got it saying hello world. Maybe I wanted it just say, you know, fish. Fish. Amazing. Or, you know, AI in games. That seems a little bit more appropriate for what we're doing here. Hey, hey. But. If you wanted to be able to edit these files, you need to be able to create your own copy of them because these are my own copies and they're made available for me. And I wanted to also have these as master files so everyone can copy them from. So there's two ways to do this. You can open it up in playground mode using this option in the top left corner. And as described here, it creates a temporary version of everything. You can edit it and mess around with it, but once it closes, it deletes it. However, if you want your own copy to keep, you can just simply go into file and then save a copy in Drive. And it will just copy it over to your Google Drive. Again, in order to do all of this, you really need to have a Google account to begin with. So go through that process if you want to try it out, but also make sure you've got some disk space on your Google Drive account because we're going to consume a good hundred or so gigabytes uh, down the line as we try and build our own models. So with that in mind, one last thing to point out is that if you see some of the other code snippets further down, you'll notice that if they have the hash at the front of it, this is actually what in programming we call a comment. So it doesn't run this line of code. So you'll see here right now, it only runs the line that says this line is not a comment. This code will print as intended because the other line of code beneath it, which is perfectly valid, has a hash in front of it. And that means it's a comment. And when the system runs and executes the code, it ignores that second line. If I delete that hash and try it again, it's actually going to print both lines. So, oh, now it's printing the other line because I deleted the hash, which makes it a comment. Okay, fairly straightforward stuff. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the video is I will introduce you to the basic text generation. We're going to do the full walkthrough on that. On part two, I'm not going to do the full walkthrough because it's going to be a huge amount of time and effort to do so. Well, running the, the model on the CPU, but I just want to give you a little bit of a heads up. Similarly with retraining on the GPU, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll actually load in my pre-trained model and show you part four in action. So let's go over to part one. So here we are, we're in part one, and this is our basic text generation framework. Once again, I'm going to have to connect which you didn't see that there because my face is in the way, but trust me, that is exactly what I just did. Now, that's all connected. We're all good. Great. Now, what we do in this very first one, this is us. We're just going to set up a instance of GPT-2 using AI TextGen, and then I'm going to generate some text from it. 
And the way that I've written all of this is you don't have to do anything in, in, except for run the code snippets as I've prepared them. And then down the bottom, you can maybe change what the prompts are that we give to the model. But other than that, you can just follow the instructions and it will work. So first of all, let me explain this first part here. So in order to for this to work, what we have to do is we have to install the library of AI text gen into our project that's running active on the VM. And then once we do that, we can create an instance of the text generation model that's already pre-built. So AI text gen already has a pre-built GPT-2 lying around. So what we do here is we're going to run these first two lines of code. And what that says is it's going to install AI text gen to the notebook so we can use it. And this is all done through a tool called pip, which is a built-in Python tool for installing software. And then we're going to import AI text gen from the library into our program so we can actually use it. So here we go. We let it run. And this takes a little second as it slowly imports and installs everything we need. And we might have a small error at the end. And this is not a big deal if it does actually crop up. Wait and see now. Great, that worked fine this time. All good. Sometimes you may, you might end up getting an error as, as a result of a dependency resolver. But if you have this specific error message that I've got here, it's safe to ignore it. It's not a big deal. I was actually getting this error message a lot when I was when I was building all the models to begin with. So next up, we want to configure the uh, text generator. And what we're going to do is just says AI equals AI text gen. So it just creates an instance, as we call it, of the GPT-2 model in this AI text gen library. And then once we've got this, we can start generating text. So we just click on the play button. And this will take a little minute because it's going to download a 548 megabyte uh, model and it's going to store it locally on this VM. So it doesn't store it on your computer. It stores it in the VM that's being used to run all this code. So don't worry about that. And there we go, yeah, uh, GPT-2 loaded with 124 million parameters and using the default GPT-2 tokenizer. And funnily enough, we're actually going to play with some of this stuff in the later uh, notebooks. So that's it. It's ready to go. It's all configured. You can start generating text with it. So the basic version is you just write AI.generate. And if I just click on this, it's just going to, you know, generate some text for me. So it's thinking about it. Um... And that was just a warning message here about the padding settings for the presentation of the text. It's safe to ignore that. Don't worry about it. There we go. And it generated a bunch of text for us. And it says, I am here to help. I am an entrepreneur and a business owner who has been working in the software industry for seven years. You know, until you said seven, this actually sounded a lot like me. But um, yeah, I've been around a lot longer than that. I have worked in many industries and have been a part of many different companies from startups and venture capital to major corporations. I've been able to find great companies for every kind of product from healthcare to health care. I'm an entrepreneur and business owner. Pretty sure you said that. Who's been working in the software industry for seven years. You already said that. And he, he just said exactly the same thing twice. Okay, so it's able to generate text for us. And if you recall, as I discussed in the video, in the main AI and games episode, this is just based, it's based on a whole bunch of existing text that it's read. So it's going to generate a bunch of text and most of it's going to make sense. But the problem for me in the context of my video is none of this sounds like me or is talking about things that are relevant to me and things that I would talk about in an episode of AI and games. Also, just for reference, there's a couple of extra parameters you can play with. So, and you can use them. I've actually set you up some examples here. So the second one, the parameter N, if you say N equals and then give it a number, that tells it how many chunks of text it's going to generate. So that time when it ran it a minute ago, that was one chunk. So I can get it to run two chunks. Uh, max length, which allows you to dictate the total length in words that that chunk is, which can be useful because what it wrote there was a very large chunk and I want to be able to constrain it. Secondly, there's also a prompt, or no, thirdly rather, there's prompt and that is going to be the starting sentence and this is how I made the video with. So you can see down at the bottom, I've created a bunch of different ones that you can play with uh, where I'm just increasingly adding more and more parameters. And so here I've got, I'm going to generate three chunks with a maximum length of 100 words and I use my prompt based on my introduction to my YouTube videos where it says, I'm Tommy Thompson, this is AI in Games, and in this episode, so we're going to run it. And there we go. 
I'm Tommy Thompson, this is AI and Games, and in this episode we discuss what you can do to help get your game on the road, even if you're doing it with an expensive car. Check out the new episodes of Houdini, Houdini the Game, and Houdini the Game for more information. More on Houdini, Houdini the Game, want to learn more about Houdini, Houdini. Great. So, it's generating text, a lot of it's not very good, but... Um, and this was critically why we had to retrain an existing model, because it can write text, but what it's saying is it's not giving me anything here that's useful in the context of the episode. But hey, this highlights to you how this whole process works. And hopefully you've been able to run this on your own machine and it ran perfectly fine. So let me give the rest of the video just dedicated to highlighting um, how parts two and three work. And then I'll actually give you a quick demo of part four because I've kept one of my own, in fact, the trained model that I have that I used to create the generated episode, I kept it. Um, I actually generated about a dozen different models and experimented with a bunch of different things. What you hear in the video is essentially the trimmed down version of that, that narrative. So, as we explained, there is now... Um, we want to be able to train a custom model so that it sounds a little bit more like our own writing. And so there's a bunch of things that we have to do here. And critically, there is actually for this, one of the key things is we actually have to use a, a bit of training data that we already have available to us. So here, what again, if I was just to connect, quickly connect to Google and just make sure this is up and running as, as envisaged, so I'd go through the usual process, but here you can t you can see that the uh, installation is a little more complicated because we have to create a tokenizer based on the data set that we're going to train the model with. And then we also have to import the utility that we need in order to train the GPT-2 model local on your computer. So this will take a little bit longer, but then by and large, what we then do is we're going to use our create our tokenizer. And this is something you have to do before you train the model. It is, allow, it is reading through the text file to kind of prepare common pairings of data that it has examined by actually looking at the data set. Now, in order to do this, what we actually have to do is we have to declare in the program that we have a file and we're gonna call it. We, have, we give it a file name and we need that file for the purposes of the project. Now for you, I've actually already prepared this. It's sitting at this link. If you click this link, it opens up in my Google Drive and it actually downloads the file for you. So that's the actual file here. And you can just click on download if you want and it'll actually download the file for you if you really want it. And then once you've got the file, what you can do is you can then import it into the project. And you need to, we really need to do this before we get down to this stage here. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is once you've actually got the file, there's two ways you can go about it. For the first one, I have provided both options. You can either import the file yourself manually or you can copy the file into your own Google Drive and then import it from the Google Drive. You don't have to worry about it too much for this one, but for this instance, let's actually just do it this way so we load in the text file manually. So my text file, excuse me, is called allepisodes.txt. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to run this bit of code. And it's now said there's now a variable in the project that is called file name. You can see here, and it's and it's going to have the value all episodes.txt. Now, in order for the next bit to work, I have to make sure I've got that file in there. So in order to do that, I went into the files tab on the left hand side, and there's a button here that says upload to session storage. And then I can just go in and find my text file. Um, I'm going to refrain from showing you the window where I'm actually doing this. It's just a, an open, but I don't want to show you all the stuff that's on in my computer right now because, you know, give me, we got to maintain some sort of mystique between us. Let's be honest. So if I find all episodes.txt and then click open, um, uploaded files will be deleted when this runtime is recycled. Okay. You can now see it appears up in the top left hand side. The file is there and it can then run the tokenizer on it. Alternatively, you can run this from Google Drive, where what you do is you actually run these two lines, these two segments of code where you mount your Google Drive to the project. And then after that, you can import the file from a specific location. We have to do this for part three. So I, I just put it in there as an option for you, but we don't have to do that. And then once you do that, You've got the file in, you've set file name as all episodes.txt. And let me say, 
if you create, you can create your own text data that you want to train the model from, you can put it in there. And if it's a different file name, just change this bit of text. So say you imported a text file that was just called um, mywords.txt, you would just change this to say mywords.txt and then make sure you run it. So run it here and you have to do that before you run the code in 2.2.2, okay? Right, so let's go back and make that all episodes.txt and rerun it, smashing. And then from here, we generate the tokenizer. And it's gonna, what it's gonna do, and it doesn't take that long, it just trains a tokenizer against the text file and sets the output for where the tokenizer should be stored. And then you configure your GPT-2 configuration because we're going to configure it to run locally on the CPU. And then we generate our AI text gen model and it's done that pretty quickly. It uses the tokenizer file that I already created and the config that we just created the line above. And then we're gonna process the data set for running the training on the model. And then we actually run the training of the model itself. This can take a little bit of time, particularly the second step. And I'm not gonna keep this running the whole time because it can very much depend on the CPU that you're running on. This could take anywhere from about five, 10 minutes. It could take you a couple of hours. And it really depends also on the parameters that we have set here. I've kept the parameters as pretty straightforward and I don't think you really need to mess with it. You can try running this if you wish. I don't see the value ultimately in training your own GPT-2 model because I cut this out from the main episode, but this doesn't perform as well as a retrained GPT-2 Neo. So there we go. In the time it's taken me to explain this, it's only like 2%, 1%, 2% finished. So what typically happens is when it's done, you can then just generate text like we did before. But I'm not going to keep it running because this video is already getting too long. So for part three, what we do is we train or rather we retrain a GPT-2 Neo model in order to then run uh, our own particular configuration. So it's going to train against our text file, but we also get it to run in the cloud. Now, this is a pretty straightforward, again, I've tried to make this as accessible as possible. One of the key things you need to do is here in section 3.0, we need to mount your Google Drive. Now, this is for two reasons. One, it's useful if you're going to import your text file which we already discussed in part two. But critically, one of the things that happens when it trains this GPU is I get it to periodically dump a copy of the model every, every several thousand iterations of its training process, but it also dumps the model uh, when it's finished. It saves a copy of it and it saves it to your Google Drive, okay? So in order to do that, you have to make sure that you run this that will connect so from google.colab import drive, and then it will mount your Google Drive onto this. And this takes a little minute. When this happens, it will request access to your Google Drive files, and it will open up, I've set connect to Google Drive. You can't see it, but it opens up a pop-up window, which asks you to sign into your Google account. And then it will ask, it will say, Google Drive for desktop wants to access your Google account. You click allow, and then this will get done. And then critically, watch the files tab over on the left hand side. This takes a little minute. Mounted at content slash drive. Great. Now, if we, we start off this in this particular folder, if we click up one level here. And so, yeah, from here you can see content and then drive and then my drive. And that is the contents of my Google Drive. I'm not going to open this because it's got some personal things in it. And, you know, I don't really want to share all that with you. Again, we got to maintain some boundaries here. But if you can see that and then you can open it up and you can see your own files that are in your Google Drive, perfect. It has worked as intended. So next up, we then import the libraries. Again, this becomes a little bit more complicated from before. We're not only uh, installing AI TextGen, we're importing the logging system, which will allow us to dump out log information as it's training the model. We're also importing uh, two separate things that are mentioned over in part two, but we use them sp specifically here, which is mounting and copying files from Google Drive. And so this is very important for AI text gen because it allows it to copy files in between. So that takes a little second and it's done. This is an optional, you don't have to do this, but if you run this command here, it shows you what GPUs are gonna be available for you to run against. 
And then here we actually load in our GPT-2 model for training and you can decide what the parameters are for this. I am running on a GPT-2 Neo 125 uh, million parameters, which is roughly, it's, a, it's around this, the same size as the GPT-2 model, uh, 355, which is about one and a half gigabytes. So you're gonna need that space in your Google Drive. And as you can see, if you click the, the run the code, it will download this for you. Again, we need all episodes.txt. For this one, I have decided, now you can, if you want, go ahead and import the file again using the uh, upload button in the top left corner. I, however, on the other hand, actually have configured all this so it runs on the Google Drive and that worked just fine. So what it did was it actually found it in my Google Drive under the folder AI in games slash script generation project and then it imported it from that folder into the project for me, which was great. So that's gave me everything I need. And let's see. Here is the final part where we actually start training the model. So we just tell it, here's the existing model. You've imported it in because you've ran this step up here. You've got your training data. And then here's you actually running the model. And I give you all the explanation of all the different uh, parameters and what they do and why they're set the way they are. And as you can see, this is actually from the last time I trained the model. This is all the output. It dumps out information on how the model is progressing and it shows you text that it generates during that process. Now, critically, um, save underscore G drive is true and that means it's going to store that those files in my Google Drive. Now, when we're finished, if you're still running this VM, you can just load it in from the active session. So you can just run the code here at 3.6.1 and that will just say, right, because it dumps a copy of the model both in the VM that Google Colab is running and it's going to save it to your Google Drive if you've, say, if you've got saved underscore uh, G drive as true. If it isn't true, then what happens is it only keeps the model in the active instance of this Google Colab that's running and as soon as you turn it off, you're going to lose the model. That's why we do the Google Colab thing. And, or the Google Drive thing in it and export it. So then here you can just run it. However, in the event you train the model and then you want to reload it back in from your Google Drive, um, you can just run this code here. Now I've said that it's gonna be stored in a particular folder, content drive, AI and games, script generation, script generation project, trained model. It's gonna be wherever you want. And remember, if you've just kept it at the root of your Google Drive, you just set from folder to, to be none as a value. But it's looking for two particular files. And I, I highlight them here, pytorch underscore model dot bin and config dot json. Those are the two files that are your trained model. So it needs those two files to import back in. And then you just run this line here in order to get it. Uh, to you first import it in with that line and then this line will recreate your GPT-2 model using that data and then you can generate text from it. And so this last one is really just where I was able to more easily demo a pre-trained model if I've already got one. So I'm going to connect to the instance. Bear in mind, by the way, you can only have so many um, Google Drive and in Google Colab instances running at once without uh, Google complaining or demanding money. So periodically, uh, what to do if you're finished using one of these and you want to move on to the next one is you go up to the top right corner and you click here and say disconnect and delete runtime. So that's the key thing you need in order for that to work. Right. So um, we need to import again from the Google Drive. We're going to create our libraries, load in the trained model, and then I can write an episode. Um, one additional thing, which is up here at the very top, is you'll note that the text has a habit of going off the side of the screen and I don't like that. So this is a really simple bit of code that if I just run this, all that does is it makes sure that the output that it generates, the text is wrapping around so I don't have to scroll right off the screen in order to look at it because that annoys me. Um, so there we go, we're gonna mount the Google Drive again. Yep, it's gonna, this is annoying. It asks for permission to access your Google Drive every time. Then we're going to import the libraries as we've done before. So it's just going to import and set up AI text gen. And again, this takes a little second as it puts it all together. Great, nice and easy. So then the third part is I'm going to train, I'm going to import the model from my Google Drive. And you can see here, I've done it all as one chunk. 
it imports the files and then it generates the instance of, of AI text gen, the GPT-2 model from that data that I've imported and it's actually gonna run it on the GPU in the cloud. So let's just pull that in. It's gonna take us a little second to copy over those files because they're big files. Well, the model file is big. And there we go. Great, nice and easy. And then with that, you can now go about, provided you've got your own trained model, you can then write your own episode of AI and Games. So this is a little extra code snippet that I just put together for testing it, just because I had this all put together. So I'm just gonna run this and it'll generate some text for me based on my trained model. I'm Tommy Thompson, this is AI and Games, and in this episode, we're going to look at a pure stealth game that makes an online multiplayer experience. It loves pure stealth games. I'll be looking at a pure stealth game that makes this series manageable. I'll be taking a look at a pure stealth game that I picked up to use today. How someone with no knowledge of game massive entertainment actually made a decision actually made an decision game system to mess with that was 128. Okay. It really loves pure stealth games, and I I think this is purely because it based it on the I think that's the Splinter Cell Blacklist episode. But hey. It's got a it's got a thing for pure stealth games, what can I say? But I've actually left you all of the written prompts that I prepared uh, where I was trying to create the episode. And so actually, if you just generate against each of these, you can then create your own version of the episode. You can see here, like this was the original opening line of the video, Aliens Colonial Marines is a game with an interested, is an interesting, I should actually say, but flawed AI architecture. Once again, this is rather simple finite state machines. A simple finite state machine whereby for F, demons to execute a specific behavior as well as other states to execute. And it's talking about GoldenEye again. Wonderful. Ah, the Swedish Artillery Regimented, which was... That was the episode on... Ah, uh, Ultima Ratio Regum, if I remember right. Um, Angelina, that's came up. Enemies in Warhammer, great. Fuel Torn Dubai, that's Spec Ops The Line. See, it's actually, it is actually picking up stuff from me. I like this one down the bottom because it, it starts and ends the episode in one paragraph. Aliens Colonial Marines is a game with an interesting but flawed AI architecture. Once again, this is rather simple and doesn't yield any further reward, but more like you're performing to watch these videos early, but it keeps you engaged than Emotional 4. Thanks for watching this episode of AI and Games on Halo Wars 2. Nice and easy. Okay, so hopefully from this you've got an understanding of how each of these uh, works and that you'll be feeling confident trying your hand at this and training your own models. Now, as I mentioned already, the key thing is that you don't actually need to use my... Oops, I've accidentally opened this window, which I didn't mean to. You don't actually need to use my episode fi uh, text file if you don't want to. You can train it against whatever you like. So go and get the complete works of Shakespeare, which you can download online as a text file, dump it in here, train a GPT-2 model, and then get it to write an episode of AI in games. Perfectly valid. Either way, I hope you find this interesting and I look forward to seeing what people create from it. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching and take care of yourselves.